Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks so much for having me. This is very exciting. Love being back on the farm um, uh, virtually, if not in person. And yes, uh, my husband, who also went to Stanford, uh, writes for Archer. So as you watch that show, he just wrote the premiere episode, uh, the first episode from this last week. So I hope you checked it out. And if not, it's on Hulu. Um, so yeah, I'm here to discuss energy in buildings and why that matters, why I focus on that, um, what energy sort of means in buildings these days, how building owners um, like my company um, are thinking about energy and how that's evolving um, as we get towards a path um, towards net zero and uh, what that means for, for all of us. So I'll just jump on in. Um, introduction. All right, so buildings and climate change. Why is this important? Um, this is important because buildings are responsible for about 40% of US um, carbon emissions. Um, we're 40% of, um, of energy consumption and there's more within building materials if you're getting into that. Um, and so when you represent 40% of um, a nation's uh, energy, it's pretty important that um, if we're gonna meet any of our climate goals that we address energy use in buildings. Um, and so, and it, it depends on where you are. Obviously in New York, buildings are around 80% of uh, energy consumption uh, and emissions, not surprisingly, because uh, transportation is so low in other places, it's a little less. So I think we're about 38% in LA. Um, so that's why uh, focusing on buildings as a method of um, adapting to climate change is really important. And I uh, wanna tell you just an introduction a little bit about my company. Um, we are a publicly traded real estate investment trust active on West Coast markets. Um, we have a primarily office uh, portfolio. So I actually have more stuff in, uh, in San Francisco near to you guys than um, we do down here in LA, but we're active in major West Coast markets. Um, I've been at Kilroy for about a decade. Um, we are a, uh, we're developers as well, and that will become important later in the conversation. So we both own, we develop, own, and manage office assets uh, in this region. And just want to uh, give you a little sense that you're talking to somebody who somewhat knows what they're talking about. So um, we're one of the winningest uh, companies in terms of all things uh, sustainability, environmental, social, and governance. Um, we have committed to achieving carbon neutral operations by uh, year end. I'll get to that a little later. We're longtime winners of Energy Star Partner of the Year, of the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. Other words, green leasing, happy to talk about any of it um, during the um, Q&A portion later. And yes, please do submit questions through the Q&A portal. So uh, I figure that not everybody has a, a deep understanding of state. So I thought I'd just do a really quick 101 because it'll be important um, later uh, for the presentation. So here is the first thing to, to think about when you think about real estate and why some might uh, care more about energy than others. Uh, one is your tenants. So this is what my typical tenant looks like. Um, we have um, a lot of great, I'm sure Stanford graduates in there. We, have, we serve a primarily tech um, tenant uh, base. Um, so we have, you know, um, you know, LinkedIn, Microsoft, uh, Dropbox, Box, you know, we, we serve a, a largely tech GM Cruise um, client base. And that's great because those companies um, employ uh, folks who really care about the environment. So that certainly makes my life a lot easier in terms of um, wanting uh, to get a bunch of great environmental initiatives uh, done, kind of more difficult if you work in an asset type that is, you know, industrial plants in maybe the mid middle of the country where you're not getting that kind of tenant, um, tenant push for sustainability that we do. The other thing to note Oh, is lease structure. Um, and this will, when we talk about solar, this will, this will come into play. Well, oh, went too far. Um, so there's basically two kinds of leases in commercial real estate. There is, um, uh, there's a triple net lease, um, which is a lease where the tenant is paying all of their own utilities. They're paying their own energy, they're paying their own water, they are probably paying their own oil. And then there is the full service growth structure um, that where the landlord is paying all of that up front and then charging the tenant back. You know, it seems like, well, the tenant pays eventually, and they do. But this becomes important when um, you want to finance a lot of energy because it's easier when the energy bill is in landlord name. It also helps us with data, helps us control the spend. Ultimately, our tenants are not, you know, it's harder for them to manage energy use in buildings than it is for uh, a, a company to have me, you know, manage energy use in buildings. And so um, companies have a largely triple net 
portfolio struggle a lot more. Um, for us, about half of my portfolio is triple net and half is full service growth. So I, I picked this project um, because this is a great project where it shows a mixture of both. Um, so you have actually the building in the middle is a fully leased Fender guitar. They're super great. Um, but they, they control those utilities. And then um, in the back, you have a building leased to Viacom, which has um, uh, which is full service growth. So it depends on the lease, but some even leases make my life harder than others when I'm trying to save energy. Corporate tax structure. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Killer is a real estate investment trust. Um, there's advantages of that. Um, I'll get to one of the advantages in just a second, but one of the disadvantages is that anything related to tax benefits uh, for, um, for things like solar and renewables, we can't take any of them. Real estate investment trusts don't pay that kind of, um, the, the kind of corporate tax that you need to be able to take advantage of that. So that makes things like renewables projects significantly more difficult, and it's something that we have to navigate. Okay, great. Um, so uh, hold tense. So the other advantage, so solar, I can talk about how I've navigated that. Um, but for uh, the great thing about being a real estate investment trust is we are a long-term hold. The way our corporate structure is we want to hold our assets for a really, really long time. Um, we don't tend to do a lot of selling of our assets. We're not, um, and when we build them, we don't build and flip. Well, that's great because then I can do things like do a major mechanical upgrade that's not going to pay itself back for a bit because I know I'll own the building the whole time. You have other companies with a different um, hold structure where they're in and out of a building in 24 months, and it makes it a lot harder to do sustainability. So when we're thinking about, okay, why does this company do well in energy efficiency and this company doesn't, a lot of it has to do with a lot of the factors that I was mentioning earlier. So, so I wanted to just spend a little time going into the basics of energy. So this is where all everybody in real estate started. When real estate was like, oh, 40%, that's kind of a lot of energy. We should do something about that. Um, we, everybody started with lighting. Uh, and so I'm going to go through sort of the basic energy projects that we do in real estate. Um, the big one of the big ones is lighting. Lighting is great uh, because it's not based often on, on, on human interaction and behavior. Uh, I do a lot of lighting retrofits and I still do a lot of lighting retrofits. Nice thing is now that the price of LEDs are coming down and down and down. This is an excellent way to save energy use in our buildings. I'm also excited to be doing a lot of these retrofits during COVID. They tend to be somewhat bothersome for our tenants. So when you don't have any tenants, it's a lot easier to get these done. Uh, mechanical system upgrades. We do these all the time. This, happens, this is a chilled beam, um, which is a more or less newfangled technology, um, but uh, we do a lot of uh, mechanical upgrades. These are adding variable frequency drives to the mechanical system. We love innovating. We have an innovation lab that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but we do a lot of fun HVAC doodads, a lot of pre-cooling um, so that we don't have to heat up as much. Um, a lot of uh, you know, messing with the filtration media and the fans and, um, you know, trying to, you know, change the, the looping systems uh, around um, how things are being heat and cooled um, in order to reduce the mechanical load um, on the building. Next is glazing. Obviously, this is something difficult uh, to deal with in uh, an existing building to change the actual glazing, but we really try to work hard on high efficient glazing where we can't control the glazing because we've bought the asset or the asset is old, um, we do a lot of work in window film, including uh, right now we're actually working on a spray on window film, which is really fun because um, it's clear. So my architects uh, don't when I, when I do it. Um, but glazing is a major contributor and in, 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 in general envelope performance is a major contributor to how energy efficient the building is. So I spend a lot of my time uh, trying to make my envelopes more efficient. Daylighting. Um, so very related to glazing. Um, we prefer not to, we prefer to let the sun um, uh, light up our spaces as opposed to using lights to light up our spaces. Um, as we all know, the most efficient uh, light bulb is the one that's not on. Um, and so uh, in all new construction, we really focus on getting um, great daylight. This is a daylighting study done on one of my buildings in San Francisco, um, at 333 Brandon Street, um, and making sure that we have enough daylight so that we don't have to run on um, lights very often during the day. So that's considered also a major energy efficiency win if you can make it happen. Um, obviously, it's important to you know, have it be comfortable, so you need shading to so you don't have just glare all the time. Uh, but daylighting is another classic strategy to reduce energy use in buildings. Um, so that's sort of the basics. Those are sort of the basic things. It's a lot, a lot about lighting, a lot about mechanical, do what you can with the envelope. Those are the basics of energy efficiency, but a lot of companies, we want to do more. So I will always do those projects. I'm doing those projects all the time. Um, but we uh, now, it used to be that a building just sort of 
accepted, uh, you know, what the grid gave it. And it was a one way street where buildings just consumed energy and the grid gave it to them. And that was how it worked. This is not how buildings interact with the grid anymore. Buildings are now what we call prosumers. So they are not, are just, they're not just consumers of energy, but they often produce energy on site, they're sending that energy back to the grid. They're changing when they're consuming energy from the grid in order to be able to help the grid's resilience. And so I'm gonna talk about a little bit of those projects now. Um, so the first thing is solar. Um, this is a picture I snapped of uh, our solar project that we did at my building at 100 Hooper Street in San Francisco. Um, now I mentioned earlier, hey, solar is a little bit difficult for us. Well, um, we cleverly just don't own on solar. So an investment in solar is really difficult um, because we can't take the federal income tax credit. Um, so we have our solar owned by um, a, a solar developer. We enter into um, a power purchase agreement. A lot of you are probably very familiar with power purchase agreements. Um, we are a little bit, we like to be a little bit um, zany. So we have both this power agreement and a lease. Um, and so in this case, the solar is actually functions as a tenant in my building. So this, the solar facility is paying me rent uh, in order to be able to lease this space um, to be on my roof space. Um, so they sign the true lease, they pay rent like any tenant would, and that able that's great financially because you can cap that, add it to value at sale. Um, and so that's how we're able to finance our solar our solar projects um, internally. We have about uh, 5.2 megawatts of on-site solar, and then we have another megawatt in construction this year, and I'm trying to uh, sign a few more. Um, oh, yes, Sarah's pointing out I talk fast. I talk super fast. I apologize. I will slow down. Um, the, uh, I get this note all the time. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so my goal is to get another megawatt signed before the end of the year. And happy to answer more questions about solar, um, tips and tricks, things that are make it difficult or uh, easy depending on the building type. Next up is demand response. So uh, basically, the grid does not, as you, many of you energy um, experts know, the grid's uh, energy need to provide is not constant. Um, consumers need more energy at different times of the day. Currently, and this has actually changed since um, I started at my company, the current um, peak times of the grid are between 4 and 8 p.m. Where, well, this is pre-COVID, when people were coming home from work and turning on their, you know, all their appliances for cooking, the television was going on, that kind of thing. And so those were the times where the grid did not, didn't have enough capacity necessarily to uh, provide all of that power. And cheaper than building a peaker plant to, serve, to uh, provide peak load was to try to get buildings to use less energy during that time. And so that's a space we've been playing in for a very long time. And there's, there's a couple of ways to, to do that. One is load shifting. So in our case, we like to pre-cool our buildings that have the ability to retain their, um, to retain temperatures overnight. So we have a couple old buildings built in the 50s, not a ton of glazing, huge thermal mass. We pre-cool those uh, during the nighttime and then we don't run the cooling system during the day. That way we are not um, consuming energy during the peak parts of the day. The next is uh, peak shaving. This is uh, getting a little fancier. This is when you're starting to turn off systems. Um, when a utility tells you uh, it would be great if you could not use so much energy right now. A lot of you have experienced our recent heat waves. Many of you maybe, maybe were asked by PG&E or your local utility not to use so much power. We do that in our buildings as well. And when we want to get really fancy in it, we do automated demand response um, where we install a lot of sophisticated software in our buildings to modulate energy use during peak times. Automated demand response works a little bit better, honestly, in manufacturing than it does in commercial real estate, where I think penetration is something like 1%. Um, and so we have been trying to sort of get a little more sophisticated as we try to play with the grid to help it be more resilient, to help us um, avoid uh, energy when it's the most expensive and that kind of thing. And so what we have done now is get into storage. So storage um, as a general concept is something that's been around for a long time. We actually have ice storage, that's what the ice cubes represent, um, thermal storage uh, in, our, in a couple of our buildings that we've had for 30 years, um, you know, where they, they make ice overnight, where the energy is inexpensive, and then the building runs off of that cooling during the day. Now recently we've been um, installing uh, standalone battery storage. Uh, this is a picture I took on my phone of a battery installation um, we did in our uh, Long Beach campus. We have 
11 um, battery storage uh, locations throughout the Southern California portfolio. Um, and the reason why we have so many in Southern California and not elsewhere are, are a couple. One is that uh, Southern California Edison had to take offline um, its nuclear uh, power station songs. And so uh, uh, the utility found itself in pretty desperate need for, um, for more uh, ability to modulate power quickly. Um, and the other reason is uh, for us in San Francisco, the fire department actually makes it quite difficult to install uh, batteries because of regulations around clearances and how far you have to be from a wall. And so those battery storage installations don't pencil. Happy to talk about more battery storage. Um, these also are set up to pay us rent. So yes, there are operational savings, but we actually take that in the form of a rent payment as well, um, which works better for us as a landlord. And obviously there is storage, um, I should mention, it's not gonna show up a ton in this um, presentation, but in terms of EV charging, um, EV charging, you know, then we're charging other people's batteries, right? Um, it's an important thing that we're dealing with in commercial real estate as the need for more and more electric vehicles are coming online and coming online and I can't install stations fast enough at this point. It is, uh, it is, it is a constant demand. We know that when uh, somebody is six times more likely to buy an electric car when there is a workplace charging and we find that as soon as we put on a station to serve a couple of drivers in that garage, all of a sudden 12 more show up within six months. We have to install more stations and more and more and that's something that well, we are dealing with because obviously my job is to reduce energy use in our buildings and um, more and more electric cars, and I am an electric car driver myself, um, increase, that, increase that capacity. And figuring that out is, uh, is challenging, but, but important as we move to a clean energy transition. So talking a little bit more about our batteries, basically two um, kinds of battery installations, and this was sort of in the middle of one of our installs. Um, there are exterior batteries, uh, which are pretty big. So the idea, um, pretty obviously, is that the building, the batteries charge up at night, so when the is cheap and hopefully cleaner um, and then the buildings run off the batteries during the most expensive part of the day um, when uh, the power is dirtier perhaps because the utility had to turn on more peaker plants to get to get their power and so the building is sort of doing arbitrage on energy so it's not energy efficiency per se but it's being smarter about the use of energy and now I'm going to talk about uh, the thing that um, drives me crazy but is super important which is building energy data um, so the history of buildings is that buildings for a long time were like this. They were like trying to drive your car with blind, without being able to see anything. Imagine driving your car where you have no idea how fast you're going, where you have no idea how much gas you have, where you'd have no idea how hot your engine is. You know nothing. That's what buildings were like for a long time. No data whatsoever. Then uh, folks figured out that if we could get some data out of the buildings, then we would be then it would be great. Then we could really get into the efficiency. We could figure out where buildings were wasting energy, where they didn't have to. And so now every building owner who cares about sustainability is now playing in the space of building data. It's not an easy road. So we went from no, no building data whatsoever to tons and tons of software that helped us get to more and more building data. And it was like being a kid store, right? Everybody just wanted to buy everything all the time. It all looked very yummy. Um, and, and there was this explosion in what, in what was called um, in my field, big data. Um, but the issue um, with that is that a lot of the data, there was too much data. And a lot of that data wasn't actionable. It was really hard for the building operator to figure out what it meant. And everybody sort of felt like they were drowning in data. You could put sort of an IoT sensor on every last coffee machine, um, but it wasn't, it didn't make a ton of sense on how to use that data to do something about your building to make it better. So, um, they, uh, so now we're in the world of right-sized data, as we like to call it. So data that is, um, uh, that is easy to digest, where we know, or we can use it to help um, reduce energy use in the building. So I'm gonna give you an example here. I'm sorry, I'm just checking the time to make sure that I'm not going over. Looks like we're good. Um, so um, this is one of my buildings um, in uh, San Francisco. This is also the great thing about this company is these were also Stanford guys who, who built this company. Um, and, uh, and this is a report that I get weekly. So almost all the buildings in my portfolio, the full service gross ones, where the meter is in my name or Kilroy's name, uh, get this report once a week. 
Um, and it just shows us uh, real, on a really simple level what's going on energy wise in our buildings. This is a pretty healthy looking building. Um, you can see it has some spikes, some peaks where some equipment is turning on at the hottest part of the day. Those are probably cooling equipment. We don't like to see those spikes. We like to see those a little more rounded because that's when you're hitting your most expensive parts of your utility of, of your utility spend. Um, so we like to shave those peaks if we can. Um, but this is looking pretty good. We're noticing good good narrow you know straight lines at the beginning and the end of the day. Um, often you have what's called a shoulder where if you have a building that doesn't fully decrease at the end of the day, it kind of maybe levels out and then decreases again. Don't want to see that. We're also seeing weekend use. Um, you know, where it is Saturday and Sunday at about the same as it is at nights during the week, which is also a good sign. Um, you don't want to see, you know, the Thursday night use being up here and your Sunday night use being here. It means something extra stuff is running on Thursday that's not supposed to. So everything gets basically this level of insight into um, building energy use. And then um, I have certain buildings where the um, building operator or the engineer said, yeah, 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 that's all really good, Sarah. I'm ready for the big stuff. So I can go ahead and show it to the audience. Um, we then have certain buildings that get a lot more sophisticated. So this is one of my buildings in San Diego, the building engineer, I love him. He's a fantastic nerd when it comes to energy efficiency and he wants more sophisticated stuff. So he's you know looking at heat maps of different space on his floors and exactly how much energy is being used on a 15 minute level, like all the time. And, and he's done really great with this project and we've seen um, some good savings from it. So um, building data can get pretty, can be too much. It can be not enough. It can be too much. We can right size it depending on the level of a desire and sophistication from the person operating on the building. So this is another uh, important way that building owners work on reducing energy use in our buildings. And now electrification. So this is the new trendy, trendy thing. Um, we are, as we try to move towards a greener um, a greener grid, it is basically, there is no path to net zero buildings on a wide scale um, that doesn't really require that all buildings move to being all electric. That is hard because the vast majority of buildings uh, use natural gas for cooking uh, and for uh, heating and for other important functions. Um, but the way that it kind of has to be is the idea is that the grid, you know, California's grid 2045 is going to be 100% renewably powered. The natural gas infrastructure can't get there. At best, I think it can get to 20% renewable. And I think that's even pretty aggressive. Um, and so if we're going for total carbon neutrality, we have to get there eventually without natural gas. And so here is how we've been working on that. So for the next uh, little bit, i blatantly stole slides from Southern California Edison, but I did that on purpose because I want you to see how they're thinking about electrification. Easy for them to say, right, because they're one of the few utilities that doesn't also sell natural gas, unlike Pacific Gas and Electric, which does both, San Diego Gas and Electric does both, um, but I think SCE slides sort of give you the utility perspective on where buildings fit in in the path towards building electrification. So oh, this is, they see it as pathway 2040. This is how we achieve the carbon neutral future. Um, and uh, they, they know that it's going to require a lot of change by 2030 in a lot of sectors in which buildings are part. Um, so the first step, as I mentioned earlier, is to decarbonize the electric, center, the electric sector, which means retail carbon free electricity. Um, it's gonna get there through a lot of renewables, utility scale wind, Solar, geothermal, can't do it without batteries because as you guys all well know, uh, the sun is this horrible habit of going down every night. Um, and so unless we can store um, all that power, um, we're never gonna be able to uh, retain renewables all day and all night long. And then uh, getting a whole lot of uh, solar, not just um, on single family homes, but in general, a lot more solar throughout their um, infrastructure, uh, around their, their sector. Um, we, we mentioned this earlier in terms of electric vehicles. Um, we are seeing uh, the deep need to, uh, to have an electric infrastructure. A lot of those charging stations, as I mentioned, are in buildings, which is causing me no amount of uh, anxiety as I figure out how to both show reductions in energy efficiency while charging all of these cars. Um, to, put the, to put that burden into some perspective, um, Los Angeles Department of Water, Water and Power um, estimates that um, it's gonna have to double basically the amount of electricity it can 
uh, transmit through its uh, distribution system in order just to be able to charge all of the cars that are going to need to come online um, to meet a lot of these goals. So it's, it's a pretty intense lift. Um, and we in buildings did not think we were going to be part of the transportation network. We were just where cars parked. And all of a sudden now buildings are these hubs where charging happens and it's, it's a new paradigm for us that that's, uh, has this learning curve to learn how to deal with. And now to buildings. So this is, this is, where, um, this is where Edison wants to get us to, which is 70% uh, of uh, space and water heating to be electrified and uh, to create codes um, around retrofits and other standards to make this possible. Um, you'll, I hear Lauren Faber O'Connor will be speaking later, which is great. It's, she's, she's been such a pleasure to have in class. Um, and she'll be talking about 100% goals, SE talks 70% goal, but the point is a whole lot of buildings have to get to all electric pretty soon um, for us to get uh, to, uh, to, meet, to meet our carbon goals. Right now, for example, the Kilroy portfolio is 19% uh, all electric, and that's pretty good. That's considered um, that's considered that's considered uh, pretty impressive uh, in terms of current real estate. Very few real estate is not mixed fuel. Um, we're being um, assisted in our transition to um, uh, all electric uh, construction uh, through things like San Francisco has a new energy uh, ordinance that or new building code ordinance that's going to require all electric construction. Currently. All of Kilroy's office uh, construction is all electric. Um, there, I can talk about this more if people have questions. It's it's still tricky. Um, we we still see a bigger footprint of electric infrastructure versus gas. Those heat pumps take up a lot more room. Um, operating costs aren't always lower because gas is cheap. Um, depends on a bunch of factors, but it's not it's not always a slam dunk. Um, and also, a lot of that equipment is is still pretty new, and there are some you know you can you can run a gas fired boiler for years and years and years. Um, the heat pumps take a little bit more maintenance. So I want to just touch on a little bit of low carbon uh, fuels and what that means. They, they're calling for natural gas to fall by half, um, which is pretty intense. So we have to figure out how to sort of wean ourselves on gas as we as we um, move to the all electric zero future, and then. No, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but I'm talking about um, how to deal with the, the remainder that we can't fully get to zero through sequestration and through, you know, other other means, um, adding more renewables elsewhere and that kind of thing. So that all leads us, and I think I'm right on time here, towards um, the last part of my presentation, and then um, we will open it up for questions. But the path toward carbon neutrality, because this is really where building owners are now realizing we have to get to. Um, and it's been an interesting road because we are not even what the environmental community first thinks of when they think of the need um, for sectors to decarbonize. Those uh, folks tend to think about manufacturing or they think about governments or cities. Um, they think about people who make stuff. Buildings have this weird um, tendency to be invisible. Like we're in buildings all the time. I bet most of you are in a building right now. Like they definitely sneak up on you. Um, but yet when we're thinking about how we're gonna meet climate goals, Buildings are not what people are, are, have traditionally been thinking of, but that is changing. Um, and what I hope to leave you with is that, that the world has sort of woken up to the importance of decarbonizing the built environment, and now real estate is scrambling uh, to figure out how to get there. I'm lucky that uh, we at Kilroy have been committed to doing this for a long time uh, because everybody is right now trying to figure out what is their path, how am I doing this, what's happening. Uh, this is my CEO, John Kilroy, uh, making the announcement that we are going to uh, get to carbon neutral by the end of this year. Um, and, at the, and he did it at the Global Climate Action Summit. Not sure if any of you were following that um, in 20, um, but countries and companies from all over the world were coming in and making these big carbon neutral declaration announcement. We were the only ones from real estate because again, buildings, nobody thinks about them. Um, but. Uh, but it was a really important and really high profile place to make it. And so I wanna talk about sort of how we're doing that. Um, you're, we're doing it through a lot of what we talked about earlier. And so it's done through energy efficiency. Um, Kilroy has reduced its energy use 17% since I got there in 2010. It's through on-site solar and battery storage. So right now about 6% of our power comes from um, the on-site solar that we've installed. But that leaves, um, a goodly chunk that's got to come from somewhere else. 
And so uh, for us, we're getting to carbon neutral operations through developing a large offsite solar uh, facility. Ours is, happens to be in Texas, happy to talk about that. Um, and that is how we're getting to the remainder to get all the way to carbon neutral. So in our case, we're not buying renewable energy certificates, um, but it's an interesting world. Um, we just had, we made this announcement in 2018 um, and we just had a competitor this year just go out and buy all the carbon credits they needed. Say, hey, we're carbon neutral six months before Kilroy is gonna get there. Um, and that's true from a carbon accounting standpoint. Um, that counts. Um, we, we decided to go through, uh, to do it through called additionality. So we were adding the renewables to the grid as opposed to buying credits from existing facilities. Um, but I love that we've now sort of created a competitive environment around getting to carbon neutrality. Um, and another reason we did this is that um, also at the Global Climate Action Summit, uh, we had all of these uh, all of these tenants, a lot of whom are our tenants. So Salesforce, for example, is a big tenant of ours. Um, say that they were going to get to carbon neutral operations, but not for themselves. They were talking about supply chains, and we as buildings are in their supply chains. And so, as I mentioned earlier, know your tenant. When you have tenants that are really focused on carbon neutrality, on energy efficiency, on all the rest, it then trickles down that those of us who run buildings have to be able to respond. And so we were able to sort of make similar declarations and satisfy a lot of our tenant um, needs around uh, carbon neutrality. Um, and it was it was nerve wracking. We're like, what's what's going to happen if we do this? Are we going to? Is there going to? You know, is anybody going to care? Are people gonna, not going to like it? You know, there's this view that, oh, if we don't get there entirely through energy efficiency plus like a wee bit of on-site solar, then it doesn't count. Um, the overall um, the overall response was really positive. So this is a nice write up we got in the San Francisco Business Times. Um, but generally, the way of the world right now is that there's not enough happening in real estate, frankly, in terms of um, energy, carbon neutrality, and uh, being able to sort of be part of the global climate conversation. And so uh, we found that when we did enter that conversation, it was a really positive um, experience. And that is about it for my, I think, I, yeah, 35 minutes. So that was Great. my presentation. If I talk too fast so that people didn't understand parts of it, I'm happy to go over it again. Finished. Uh, you you talked too fast, but you finished early. So that's a, probably a good trade off. Uh, so, uh, Sarah, we have qu quite a few questions. So, oh, uh, one that is uh, you kind of touched on several points and that is um, uh, electric, all electric building mandates. Are those a good thing or a bad thing from your perspective? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say with my Sarah hat on versus my people have to lease my buildings hat on. I think they're overall a good thing, um, and I think they even the playing field. Um, but they make things difficult from a leasing perspective. Um, for example, we have some multifamily assets, and the idea that they're gonna have all electric stoves um, is something that the leasing team is concerned about. Um, and similarly, uh, the major project for ours that that's going to impact um, has a market hall with restaurants. And the idea that we have to tell every single one of those restaurant tenants they can't use induction cooking, they, that they can't cook with gas, that they have to do induction cooking is I think going to be challenging, especially because that equipment is currently a bit more expensive than traditional gas fired cooking equipment. So there are challenges um, with that. Um, I think overall, it's a really good thing to get to all electric. We just, there isn't another, to me, pathway to full, to full carbon neutrality in buildings without an all electric requirement. Um, so obviously, you know, we've been doing it proactively. I look forward to a lot of our competitors being forced to follow suit. So I think it's a good thing, but there is going to be some growing pains around it. We've had, um, there's been, you know, a lot of successes at Berkeley has done this. I mean, there's been, there's been jurisdictions that have adopted such ordinances. And yes, there's some complaining, but I think overall it's gone well. Um, but it's, it's certainly, it's not, it's not easy. Yeah, then we had a whole cluster of questions regarding um, evaluation methods. How do you decide um, what kinds of energy efficiency and other investments to make? So let's start with, uh, 
a, a kind of a straightforward economic valuation mm -hmm. yeah in the form of do you trade off first cost versus discounted present value savings or is there more that you put into that uh, yeah. those kinds of assessments yes this is a very good question and i should have had a whole green finance part of the presentation and a green leasing part of the presentation which will be now so um because those two things are highly related so i control um, as part of my job an energy efficiency uh, or an efficiency budget um, for the company um, and that budget has to be dedicated towards efficiency projects um, which is what we're talking about it goes to certification so lead um, well fit well health is not part of this conversation though i'm happy to touch on it um, especially as we can talk probably um, importantly about how COVID is affecting building energy use um, and then EV charging stations. So I'm the one who puts those in. Now, uh, we, there, we have sort of a blessing and a curse at Kilroy, which is we have green leases. Um, and what is a green lease? A, gre a green lease is a, le is a lease that aligns landlord and tenant incentives and interest and energy. Because traditionally the problem is the landlord, you know, the, you know, the tenant's gonna pay the energy use anyway, why, as the landlord, do I even care about energy efficiency? That's what's called the split incentive. And so what my leases say is that I can recover all that capital that I put into an energy um, upgrade in my building from the tenant, but I recover it over a payback period, uh, which is better than recovering it over a traditional lease, which is written, recovered over the lifetime of the equipment. Well, you have an LED that lasts 20 years, it's not gonna do a ton of good. So I'm lucky that we have green leases and we green them more since I got to Kilroy. Um, we're part of the inaugural class of Green Lease Leaders in 14 and have been in part of that program since then. Um, but it does mean, and it pains me to say this, is that um, uh, ROI, simple payback, is my financial metric when I make my um, decisions as to how to allocate my sustainability budget. And I am the I'm first in line as knowing that this is not the best financial metric to use. I went to business school. Um, but uh, you know, NPV, IRR, you know, would be better. But because we recover um, our investments in energy efficiency in existing buildings, I have a little more leeway for fun stuff in new construction. Um, because we recover that over payback period, payback period is what I have to use. And I am stuck um, from us at a three-year payback period. Um, the average lease is, let's call it five years, and you have to assume tenants are moving in and out. So yeah, I'm, I'm capped at a three-year payback, which is, which is a bummer. Uh, because there's a lot of great projects out there that uh, take, need a little more time um, to pay themselves back. Um, so we're able to sort of get around that in a couple of ways. For example, solar, I don't own it. It's not an upfront capital investment, so that's fine. You know, solar itself is much longer payback, but because it's not on our books, that's fine. Batteries were the same way. Um, we do a lot of work with our utilities um, and on-bill financing. Which is, which is a program that's had a, a long and rough road. Uh, we're still doing on-bill financing projects now, um, and those the utilities set with the payback, and that's cost neutral to the tenant. So I'm always trying to find ways to, um, to creatively uh, both deploy my capital um, in a way that makes sense um, financially, and then also find other funding sources that allow us to do longer term payback projects. But even, you know, Kilroy has an innovation lab where I'm doing a lot of piloting of clean tech as it relates to the prop tech sector. And even those pilots, for the most part, need to uh, uh, meet um, the payback requirements that I mentioned. Um, although there are some utility like field demonstration funds through their emerging technologies programs that I'm able to take advantage of. So long answer to that question, but um, I use simple payback, but don't you use simple payback? Is basically <laughs> <It's> <laughs> terrific. Yeah, uh, uh, there are a set of uh, follow-on questions that have to do what is generically called the rebound effect. So this I find a very clever question for someone like you. Um, it, two related questions. Have you seen customers and tenants uh, demand increase because of your clean energy and sustainability efforts? This would be because of the cost reduction. Uh, and if yes, is it the cost reduction or is there an environment first angle, which I assume means because it's all environmentally sustainable, we're gonna go large just to prove a point. So, sorry, the question is, do I have tenants that use more energy just because I've done a good job reducing energy? The answer is is not, not on purpose, um, but 
Um, I have two things right now, one of which I, I've been talking about a lot, one of which I just hinted at, um, that are giving me pause, or three, there's three things. One is tenants are increasing in their plug load requirements. So that's the stuff you plug in. You know, it used to be one person had one monitor and now two monitors and some people have three monitors, right? So tenant plug loads are an average going up as we just plug more and more stuff in. Um, so that is causing increases. Um, the second thing is more and more EV charging. I'll just give you an example. I have a tenant, I won't say who, but um, in Los Angeles who asked for in their, it's a new development project, they asked for a hundred charging stations, a hundred. Um, for their one, it's a pretty big campus, but, and, and the, and our utility said they couldn't do it. Our utility was like, we literally cannot deliver that amount of power to the site. You cannot have that many stations, which is, I think, indicative of, I think, where we're going as the demand for EV is going to explode. And so EV demand goes up and up and up and up every year. The final thing that is making me really nervous, um, especially because new guidance just came out on Friday is ventilation for viral transmission mitigation. Um, one of the things that this uh, pandemic has, I think, taught people in a way that I think a lot of us in buildings have been shouting for a long time is buildings are important. Buildings have ex externalities. Buildings can hurt the environment. They can impact your health. They can impact your productivity. I think people are realizing now that that's really true. And so, um, but one of the ways that you're supposed to mitigate viral transmission in buildings is by increasing that ventilation flats. Um, and that's really hard because I've been spending a lot of time trying to not use more than we need to for ventilation. Obviously, buildings to be healthy. I believe in the importance of great outside air. We did a whole TEDx talk about the subject. Um, but we, but you know, ventilating all the time it has energy consequences for a lot of buildings that weren't designed to provide 100% outside air all the time. And that it's fine now because there's no plug loads, right? Because people are home. But I definitely have buildings that aren't decreasing their energy use, particularly because we have a tenant who says, okay, well, I might send five people of our 200 in and they better have 100% outside air all the time. So these buildings that are just running their ventilation constantly. Um, and I'm nervous about what that's going to do to all, all of the energy efficiency work I've been doing once we reoccupy. Most important, obviously, saving lives. Um, so I don't want to discount that, but I'm figuring out how to best, uh, you know, uh, meet all of the guidelines while having efficient buildings is like really going to be tricky. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I don't have a magic answer. I mean, there's some technologies out there, like we found a fan that has like, you know, allows for um, uh, more horsepower, but, you know, was uh, less, pulled less energy than the fan we were going to specify. There's a couple wins like that, but uh, and not just ventilation, but it's higher filtration media. We're asking our buildings to pull more air through through much, much more tighter filters. And that also is going to increase energy use. So I just had this happen where I had a tenant who, who said, this is a construction project. Okay, we definitely want to leave platinum building, but you have to run the air all the time. And we were like, well, I can't do both of those things. So which one do we want here? And this is already building already was it's designed for 30% more than ASHRAE standard for outside air. I mean, it was, it was a good building. It is a good building. Um, but yeah, so those conversations are getting, are getting tricky. So we have a bunch of questions, not surprisingly, on what I would call um, high-tech, uh, uh, you know, future, futuristic type technology. Some of mm -hmm. them you, you I'll be doing. And I, I, uh, so far, I've picked up solar power windows, low-cost, very high-efficiency uh, building integrated solar solar tiles, things of that nature, or you could even go beyond that if you're thinking about something uh, prospectively at this point. Yeah, so we, our, our, our photovoltaics are currently pretty um, uh, traditional looking. Um, I have been looking at Idea Lab. I work for a company, one of the incubated companies did this, um, of uh, solar panels that track the sun. So um, where, the, where the racking system, you know, follows the sun's rays. Um, building integrated photovoltaics and um, those, and uh, so vertical photovoltaics and then building integrated photovoltaics currently, um, they're not very efficient, um, especially when you're building like I do typically, which is in like core downtown environments with a lot of shading from surrounding buildings. Um, and remember that I don't own my own solar. Right, so that my solar is owned 
by a third party. And so they need a high level of efficiency if they're going to finance my project. Um, my biggest all electric project um, is called the Flower Mart in San Francisco. And I, and it's a 2 million square foot project. And if we coded the entire south facing, and I think and east facing, if I'm remembering the study we did, uh, facade with integrated photovoltaics, it was only 1% of the core building's energy use. Vertical is not, um, it's not super efficient right now. Um, and so you do it for other reasons, but we haven't had those reasons. So I have not been playing much in the like crazy renewable space. The other thing is the financing on those things is, is, is tricky. Um, where I do have a lot of more fun playing with new technologies is, like I said, through the Kilroy Innovation Lab, when we have been piloting um, the following, that, that sort of that nano, nanotechnology spray and window film, which has worked well. A um, bunch of management projects, you know, what can I turn off when without bothering users so that we're not using so much uh, power. Um, we've had some cool pre-cooling projects. So you stick a panel on top of the mechanical equipment and it um, uses a little bit of mist to cool the um, to cool the air so the idea is the problem with buildings is right like that you know they're heating up they're often dealing with heating up and cooling air that's already fine when it goes through the piping it's not and then it heats up and they have to cool it again so how do you deal with that pre-cooling so it doesn't have to work as hard um, and then that that uh, fancy technology what is going on with my light right now sorry um, that, that that fancy technology um, uh, the, that was giving really, really granular energy data um, was also piloted through the Keller Innovation Lab. And I just signed up another um, clean tech incubator to be another uh, energy partner um, through it. So I'm constantly looking for um, opportunities to beyond, uh, sorry, sorry there's just, it's just the afternoon light from my window. It looks like I'm... <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks like there's some sort of like police siren or something. Um, but it's a, um, so I'm constantly looking for those opportunities in addition to always doing the traditional retrofits of lighting, windows, HVAC. It's always, it feels like I'm always doing lighting, windows, HVAC, lighting, windows, HVAC. And I want to be able to do um, more. Commercial real estate is typically a really hard market to penetrate. Um, we are not easy. It's hard to sell to us. Um, there's very few companies that even have the right person to sell to, right? I mean, you're lucky. I mean, for example, in all of Los Angeles, um, for all of Los Angeles real estate, real estate, there are six people with my job that I know of. Mm, maybe eight, depending if you count the studios who have their own sort of constraints on things. And that's it. There's a lot of real estate, right? and six people even do sustainability. And um, and so, you know, it's funny. Like I remember going on maternity leave, and one of them are saying, "Well, now I don't have anybody to pitch to." Because I was like, you're the only one. Um, and so we're, we're really hard to get to. It's really hard to find the decision maker. I mean, what happens if you're a real estate portfolio ultimately owned by some Chinese fund that will never come on site? Like, how do you get that capital allocation? Um, so that's difficult. Um, it's prop tech is, is, a, is a pretty tricky space, but real estate and, and real estate hates change. It's a very, it's a, honestly, a fairly um, resistant to change industry, but that's changing um, because what we have now um, which I mentioned earlier, is we have a lot of investor pressure around sustainability. So real estate companies can no longer ignore this. I think any of you might have seen BlackRock's letter around um, you know, financial reporting and sustainability. We have uh, ratings agencies are now buying um, you know, climate change projection software so that you know, they're able to rate large swaths of real estate. Um, I'm really sorry about this cloud things that happening outside. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, um, and so ratings agencies know, investors know, that obviously the European and Australian investors have been really putting the pressure, but we're seeing so many more folks in real estate saying, okay, I can't ignore it anymore. I can't just pretend it's not happening. It does apply to me. Now I have to deal with it. So I'm hoping we see more adoption of new technologies soon, um, but it's been, it's been a little on, in the innovation space in real estate for, for a long time from the owners. Uh, now that we have two minutes left, I'll unfairly oh, ask you the big, the big question of the day, uh, and that is how does how is the pandemic affecting your business, and what mm -hmm. do you think will happen once we get past the uh, proverbial uh, right. uh, end of, end of the uh, uh, pandemic? Well, um, we're going to see a lot more waste as we, you know, single use plastics are coming back you know, no shared utensils, a whole lot of PPE that's going to be disposable thrown away. 
I really worry about that. Um, this whole never take public transportation thing that's coming out of the CDC is pretty sad. So I think we're going to see, um, you know, a lot of our scope three emissions go up as people uh, don't take um, public transit unless they don't have another alternative. Um, and then these ventilation rates, which are going to be tricky. So I don't see uh, amazing things happening from sustainability, but what I will say is that I've seen is companies are still making climate commitments in the middle of the pandemic and tenants still care a lot about sustainability in the middle of the pandemic. I tenants were like, okay, what do we, what do we do? Like we both see that there's a problem. It's not like the tenants are like, okay, we can just pretend sustainability isn't a thing. So there is no less pressure to have a really uh, sustainable energy efficient portfolio, but there's a lot of, it's going to cause a lot of problems, which we're essentially ignoring right now. Our buildings are down 25 to 40%. Uh, this is funny. They're not down more than that. I think what the other thing we've realized in the pandemic is that our building energy use is really sticky. Um, you know, a building goes down to 1% occupancy, but it doesn't go down to like 1% of its energy use because buildings were designed to ramp down where we're asking. But so basically we're having this giant dip in all things consumption because there's nobody there in office, obviously residential, everything's up. Um, you know, it depends on your asset type. Uh, but after the pandemic and when everybody comes back, we'll see. Good. Uh, well, there was a, a great deal of optimism in your response. So on that happy note, I'd like to thank you, uh, okay. Sarah, for a uh, inspiring talk in the audience for a uh, terrific set of questions. We're now up to 43 questions. I probably only got through about half of them. So either you can uh, write to- Yeah, send them uh, on over. Yeah, send, send them on over. I think we'll print out a transcript of all the questions that were asked. So thanks once again. Have a good day and come visit us after the uh, pandemic. And I would love to. Come back to the farm. <laughs>